Did you know Higher Ed's premier tech conference, Elucian Live, is almost here. Join industry leaders in New Orleans, March 26th through 29th. Discover insights and game-changing solutions to unlock possibility and drive student success. Register at elive.elucian.com. Epic. Three higher ed authors, 100 plus college and university presidents, dozens of actionable insights for academic leaders. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast where we make education your business. Do you saw that? You hear that pause in there? I almost forgot my own intro, but I didn't. We keep going here. It's 557 episodes that we released to this podcast, and we aren't stopping anytime soon. Of course, co founder and uh, partner Elvin Freitas has me booked out every single day through the end of April. Every single day, if you could, uh, Saturday and Sundays, of, of course, aside, but every single weekday at my lunch, um, except for this episode that I'm doing. So, but most days at my lunch, I podcast. Um, and um, for those of you, I say it every episode and will forever. If you've bought a copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education that Kate Colbert and I and Elvin wrote together, taking the first 125 presidents that we interviewed on this podcast and taking all their insights and putting it together in a 500 plus page book, which sounds like a lot, but it's less than listening to 125 podcasts. Uh, and you're going to get those insights if you pick up the copy of the book and thank you for your support. Um, as my my guest co-host said, I'm surrounded by journalists in this episode. <laughs> uh, here she is, ladies and gentlemen, my guest co-host. You know her, you love her. She's Kathleen Kennedy Manzo. She's EVP for Education, Labor, and Economy at Hager Sharp. Kathleen, what's going on? Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. You would be bored if you weren't booked every minute of every day. Come on. I don't know. Admit it. I, okay, <laughs> I'll admit it a little bit, but I feel like I'd find something to do. Maybe I'd go for another degree. Um, that sounds <laughs> that sounds crazy. Maybe not. Maybe In I your next life, that. maybe. My next uh, life. I, I did want to say, you know, as a former longtime education journalist, I'm really excited for this chance to talk with John. I followed his work for a long time. He's really well known in the field. He does some really amazing work that is very important and impactful. Um, I do want to say that in my role at Hager Sharp, I do work with Lumina Foundation, which provides some financial support to Heckinger Report, as they do to other nonprofit newsrooms. But Heckinger is, is, you know, an award-winning team of journalists, and um, I think that, you know, people turn to them, uh, and especially to John's work uh, through the pandemic and beyond, uh, to really get the insights and the and the wisdom of uh, all the folks out there in higher ed and what they're dealing with. What I love about a good podcast episode, Kathleen, is you can introduce my guest before I even introduce my guest. That's why I love having you on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Marcus. He is higher education editor at the Hetchinger Report. Now, and you knew before I even introduced him, uh, audience. So, John, how are you today? I'm, uh, my head is swelling after that, that introduction. But yeah, I'm, I'm great. Thank you. That's why I bring Kathleen here. She's amazing. Um, and I like that little disclaimer you had, Kathleen. And I would say that I just invited you to come co-host with me because I like having you here for the record. So <laughs> those are the setup. Um, John, uh, to say you're well-known in higher education would be an understatement. Um, <laughs> I do follow you on social, so I get to see all of the positive and negative comments that your stories get, which I think is a good sign of, uh, a, a sign of good journalism. Um, so can you, can you just level set for us How'd you get into this business reporting in higher ed? Is it a, is it a report, a, a boring beat higher education? Is it getting more exciting? Is it, you know, a fulfilling your journalistic um, uh, tendency, if you will? And, you know, what do you think about what's going on right now in higher ed? Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of job security in what's going on right now in higher ed. It's, uh, it's I, I, I'm not telling anyone anything they don't already know to say it's kind of in dysfunction. Uh, our success rates are very, very poor. They've, uh, they haven't improved for quite a long time. Our enrollment is well below what it was, not just before the pandemic, but the decline in enrollment that we saw very sharply in the last few years actually began 10 years ago. And, uh, and yet colleges and universities continue to, to spend and build and hire without necessarily solving a lot of the underlying problems that I think we're going to talk about today. Where do we begin? 
I think that's the question. Where do we begin? Because this is a multi-layered, very complicated. I don't, I don't think higher ed could do simple problems. We only do complicated ones, and that's part of the DNA of higher education. I do want to start, though, I think a good place for us to start, and you can uh, you can disagree and start wherever you want, but the um, uh, story you put out about the Utah Valley uh, president who was from technology, who came in and said, um, and I can't remember her name, Astrid, I think, was her Astrid Tumanis or something like that. I was actually supposed to, little known fact, I was supposed to interview you, her the day before you put out that story and I had to cancel and I haven't been able to get her back. I hope you get to talk to her. She's great. Yeah, I'm really excited. But she comes in and says, accountability. We have to be accountable for things, for performance, for outcomes, for our spending. And everybody goes, no. Is that just fundamentally wrong? Not everybody goes no, the faculty goes no. And, and therein lies a really core problem about what's happening in higher education. Um, there's a lot of pressure on higher education to show results because up until now, the results have been quite poor. And when I speak about higher education, I'm painting with a broad brush. There are some institutions that have very high graduation rates, but collectively we have very low graduation rates. We have very high dropout rates. One in four students who start in the first year do not return in the second year. That's, that, that's a success rate that if you were a private business, you'd be out of business. 43% um, of students finish in four years. 90% of them think they will finish in four years with a four-year degree, but only 43% of them actually do. People are, are uh, becoming more aware of this than I think they have been in the past. And in response, not just presidents, but legislatures and, and, and families and consumers and advocacy groups are putting a lot of pressure on universities to, to improve, and they aren't improving. Um, so what, what happened at Utah Valley University, we thought was a really interesting case study. Utah Valley University has one of the lowest graduation, graduation rates. And at this it, in this context, I'm talking about six-year graduation rates. Only a third of their students graduate within six years. That's oh half. It, it's it's it is mind-blowing, and it's half the national average. Um, it's 499th out of 590 public universities. I, that would be embarrassing if I was on that faculty. And yet, nice. the faculty is pushing back against. Um, some reforms that the president uh, has proposed. The president came from Microsoft. She was a business executive. This is increasingly the case. More presidents are being chosen from outside academia to run universities and colleges. And they're coming in with a completely different set of, of priorities and, and, and policies. Um, some of what the faculty say is, is perfectly legitimate. There is a tradition in American higher education of shared governance, it, wherein the faculty are supposed to make the academic decisions. But there's a point at which you can't just keep saying no, you have to explain how you're going to fix this problem. True. Do you think there's an assimil it You're just like, it's, it's, that's it, right? My mind's breaking right now. This is actually watching somebody's mind break. You guys are witnessing it. I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday and I said, I feel, I, I, I worked in for-profit at the the dark, you know, for-profit ed for 15 years. Although I worked with a very good actor who had no problems for years and years and years. And then I transitioned into nonprofit ed and I've felt this pull of assimilation culture. It's like I'm being sucked into this culture of sometimes inaction or, you know, assimilating to this way of doing things because nobody likes the, how fast I like to move or when I say, well, that's why do we have to do that? You know, why do we do it that way? And well, that's that's the way it's done here. Is there an assimilation culture expectation within higher ed that you've seen that is just kind of like Robert's rules and you got to go about these things this way and everybody's afraid to break glass a little bit? Well, first, I'm sorry that I broke your head. And second, <laughs> um, it's not the first time it's happened. I, promise you. <laughs> uh, I, I think the I think the cultural issue that we're we're up against here is a kind of there's you've heard the ivory tower reference and there's a lot of validity to that faculty live in another world uh, they they live in a world that's a little bit different actually in some cases significantly different than the world the rest of us live in they have a much different work schedule um they uh, on, a, on a very practical level they get much better benefits in many cases their own kids go to college for free which makes it hard for them to uh, really sympathize with what their students and their families are going through. Um, all of those sort of combine with this, this idea, this perfectly legitimate and very important idea of shared governance, but faculty have been very slow to recognize the, the, the pressure that, it, that, 
this sector is under right now and very slow to recognize the need for change. Uh, and therefore they've been pushing up against it. Um, this is not, this is less the case. So Utah Valley University is a big, in fact, the biggest public university in Utah. I find that at small private tuition dependent uh, regional colleges, the faculty is beginning to recognize the need for change. And they're beginning to recognize the need for change because they're seeing some of their friends and, and counterparts at other universities losing their jobs because the, the universities and colleges are closing. I think that they've finally uh, awakened to the reality of the crisis that's confronting higher education. That has more, happened more slowly at public universities, although several of them have invoked emergency measures that they were allowed during COVID to, to cut huge numbers of programs, which is also a very bad idea. M many of them, and I've written about this in rural areas, have cut literally dozens of programs, not fringe programs, but English and biology and physics and philosophy. Um, and those faculty are losing their jobs too. So I think that in some places, faculty are recognizing the need for change in ways they haven't in the past. But I mean, there, a, a, a university chancellor once told me, uh, you know, how many faculty does it change to, uh, to, does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is, what do you mean change? So <laughs> there's, there's a very limited, I think, huh? or his, historically, there's been a very limited recognition of, of the need for this reform. And right now that need is really critical. Hmm. I'm going to keep going. I, I would keep going, but Kathleen, you're here. So no, it's your <laughs> turn. Yeah. I'm, I'm recalling a little bit, you know, 25 years ago, I covered higher education for a couple of trade publications. And um, although even then there was a, you know, big call for change in many ways, especially increasing diversity at campuses, um, you know, Colleges and universities were resting on their laurels. I mean, for generations, they're the, they're the envy of the world. Um, you know, they bring in lots of international students because of the reputation of these institutions. But um, kind of like journalism, you know, the world has changed. You know, people are questioning um, whether they need these essential institutions or not. What's the value proposition? So I feel like there's a you know, this ex existential crisis, you know, as you said, starting with the en enrollment declines, but then, you know, accelerated by the pandemic, um, you know, at, one, at what point do people, you know, at the academy see, like, we're not going to be here if we don't, you know, get on board and, you know, make ourselves uncomfortable and move forward really quickly. When I speak with people in higher education, I often preface my remarks by saying that um, my industry, journalism, um, has has suffered some of the same, uh, has made a lot of them the same mistakes. Uh, but there's a difference in terms of higher education. I think what's happening in higher education is that the the public is questioning the value of higher education. We see this in countless surveys, uh, especially in the last few years. And I believe firmly that I, I watched forever as the price kept going up and going up and going up and wondering when is this going to when is this going to hit when are people going to start voting with their feet and now they're voting with their feet the, the price finally moved beyond anything that was realistic for people they began to look more closely at the value for the money they were getting and they rightly understood it not to be very, very good. Um, you also mentioned Envy of the World. We're not anymore. We're, I think I'd have to look again in the OECD among um, among uh, developed countries, 16th or 18th in the proportion of our population with degrees in a in a world that that's largely now about knowledge industries. We're way behind and um, people aren't coming here. We have an, there's an enormous amount of competition for international students from other countries. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that international students might not want to come here, and they're not all universities' fault. There's xenophobia and guns and politics, but um, but they aren't coming here. And in in many instances, they're going to, to to competing countries, but they're also in India and China, which are two of our biggest sending nations, are building huge numbers of new universities, and their college going rates are going way way up, whereas our college going rates. That is the number of high school graduates going straight to college 
um, are are going uh, down in a in a really scary at really scary rates. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, take you back to that value convo because you bring up and I talk. I ask every guest. I'm like, you know, what do you think about what's going on with the value and um, one of your recent articles, you're talking about price resetting. There's a number of universities looking at price resetting, which the, the really interesting phenomenon about higher ed and one that I personally deal with because I work at Lindenwood University in St. Charles and we're having conversations about tuition and what are we going to do? And it's really, really easy to raise tuition, right? I really need to keep this piece of technology for student services. And well, we're just going to have to charge the students an extra $200 fee if we're going to keep that. So plunk, 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 plunk. Next thing you know, tuition's gone up and I'd like to keep all these awesome things around me. It's a lot harder to go. This is the, this is the tuition. Here's the total revenue. And now we can only keep certain things. And what are we going to let go? Um, but the phenomenon being that sometimes the tuition reset, um, with all good intention doesn't have the intended effect it does or you'd think it would because somewhere somehow people are still equating price gross price with quality in higher ed and there's this i don't know diminishing return conversation it's really interesting and you just wonder is, a, is an institution that resets their price and goes just for what a student's going to pay really going to reap the benefits of enrollment or is that going to hurt them in the long run? That's literally a question because it's something that I think a lot of people are dealing with. Yeah, it's a it's a weird and uniquely American thing that if it doesn't cost much, we don't think it's worth much. What the tuition resets are doing now that are happening and, and many, many more are happening. And they're mostly at, again, those small tuition dependent regional colleges that are desperate for enrollment. Um, the it's not only that that they're worried that lowering the price might make think make people think they're not worth as much it's also that this strange kind of dynamic that we employ in pricing higher education sets a high price and then provides a high discount and because people love a discount and especially people that don't necessarily need the financial aid um, but can afford to pay the tuition, the way you the way you attract to those people is to say, well, your kid gets a scholarship. People love a scholarship. They, they believe that it's because their kid is really smart. It may or may not be because their kid is really smart. There might be something completely unrelated going on there that has to do with the enrollment management uh, sort of calculations that the college is making. But another danger of what's happening is that um, uh, you know, we're seeing th th this discount rate. So on average, colleges and universities in America, this is as of last year, gave away 52% of their revenue from tuition. 52% of it went back out the door in the form of discounts and financial aid. That again is unsustainable. If you were a private business, you couldn't give away 52% of your revenue and stay in business. And that's that's beginning to... Uh, to, to be one of the reasons that colleges and universities are shutting down, but no one wants to blink. No one wants to stop doing that. Now we're beginning to see these tuition resets where they're taking the their price and instead of charging that full price that you see advertised that almost no one actually pays, they're lowering it to what, what they call the net price, which is what people actually pay on average after discounts and financial aid. Um, it will be interesting to see in the past the psychology has worked against them and they they might get a, a little bit of a of a bump for a year or two and then people start to question the value if the price is lower that might now be different i think people might now be drawn to those kinds of models because they're thinking more about the cost you will learn by the numbers i will teach you a little lesson from john on tuition discounting there kathleen <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it made me um, think about community colleges, though, because, you know, talk about low cost and really accessible. Um, on a previous ex episode, someone talked about them being the gem of higher ed. Um, I mean, you've written recently about the challenge of community college students face in transferring and, you know, talk about a low graduation rate. But um, I wonder if you see opportunities for some sectors of higher ed right now to really, you know, shift the dynamic and uh, find ways to um, differentiate themselves in the in the market and and maybe turn around this crisis they're facing. Um, I wish I could. I wish I could answer that question because that would make me very rich. 
uh, everyone would want the answer to that question. They're, they're, they're stumbling around for answers. For many of them, the answer is graduate education, but the National Student Clearinghouse data that, that just came out um, uh, shows us that um, graduate enrollment is down by about a percent. Um, graduate enrollment is typically used by colleges and universities to uh, subsidize undergraduate education. Um, and, and that worked a little bit, but in fact, if you look at um, satisfaction rates, uh, people who go through graduate programs, including professional programs, including law, don't like that, aren't happy, aren't satisfied with the with the uh, what they get for their money, uh, and I think that's coming back to bite them. You ask about community colleges; that's a really interesting question, and one we're actually looking at right now. Um, what's been going on with community colleges? The enrollment decline has been just massive and and long long standing. Um, are they the gem of higher education? I guess they could be, but they they are they fall short in a lot of really important areas because they tend to enroll the most vulnerable students and provide them with the least support and co community colleges often blame that on the fact that they're funded at much lower levels per student than four-year universities and in some states community colleges spend less per student than high schools do um i think to some degree it's absolutely true, but to some degree, it's also an excuse. I think that community colleges, and I spend time at them, are um, over like all of higher education, overly complex. But that's particularly difficult for their students um, to navigate a an unnecessarily complicated process. So, for example, more than eighty percent of people that start at community colleges plan to eventually get a bachelor's degree. Only seventeen percent of them ever, ever actually do that that's partly because of problems in their own lives and and you know life happens and things come up and interrupt their plans but it's also because the the courses that they take at community colleges don't transfer it's because there's no advising um we had a news release a couple of years ago that that was mind blowing it was a college that was bragging about the fact that they were making um advising mandatory and my response was it wasn't mandatory how could advising not be mandatory? Yikes. You're taking you're taking students who often come from underrepresented groups whose parents didn't go to college and you're not giving them advising. So they take courses they don't need. They spend money that they don't that they don't have to. The the credits don't transfer. It's a it's a gigantic mess. And um yeah, I mean, I visited a community college uh just recently which is working on this problem, but it, it has a very low transfer rate. And we talked to students who were there studying. This was just at the end of the last semester. They were studying for finals. They were calling four-year universities to which they wanted to transfer to ask them, what do I need to do here at my community college? Because nobody at the community college was telling them. So, uh, and even the president of that community college said, this is ridiculous. This is a terrible system and we need to fix it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some um, um, amazing news. It's time to work together to solve the puzzle of success in higher education. Belusian Live returns to New Orleans for March 26th through 29th to help you unlock possibility for your institution. And yes, the EdUp experience will be there recording live. Industry leaders from all across the world are converging to discover new insights, game-changing solutions, and powerful connections, all with the goal of addressing higher ed's greatest opportunities and biggest challenges. You do not want to miss Elusian Live. Learn more and secure your seat today at elive.elusian.com. It will be um, um, amazing. You know that the world of higher education is experiencing evolutions and revolutions. You want to be part of the progress. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education with insights from more than 100 college and university presidents will show you how. Get your copy of Commencement, the Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education now on Amazon right away. We think you're going to love it. It's a a a amazing. Transfer pathways are complicated, too. Um, you know, I, I, I get to deal with this fun stuff all, all the time. It's, it's, it's tough, particularly tough when you have a student who comes from an institution and says, hey, I want to I take my credits. I want to transfer them. You can say, yeah, we'll take those credits, but you can't apply them to this major that you're hoping to apply them to. And you you wonder how, how, I always say to when I deal with faculty and staff and whatever, how are we making it hard? Could could we make these credits fit? 
I mean, they don't have to map exactly. You have to determine that the learning outcomes match. But we can then we can't charge you tuition for those credits that we let you transfer in. It's kind of like, you know, so there is this, I don't know, un unwillingness to move to serve the student. There are institutions that are really good at it that go, you know what, we're going to serve the student, we're going to do what we have to, we're going to figure this out. And then in, there's the, the easy answer, which is no, we're not going to do this, they don't transfer, you just go ahead and tell the student that, you know, we'll take this many, but not this many. You think there's a customer service piece of higher ed that I don't know, maybe the bigger question is, are we a service industry to some degree now because of the ways a student can interact with us? No, that's an easy one. We're not, they're not there for students. That's not how these institutions have evolved. They were there for faculty, faculty that want to teach a course, uh, you know, that, 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 that um, relates to the doctoral thesis they wrote uh, and make it an elective that won't transfer. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that faculty necessarily need to compromise on their standards in order to accept transfer credits. I think universities and colleges just need to talk to each other and and make sure that the that 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 the courses that they're teaching line up. The the play, the community college I went to was the Community College of Rhode Island. Rhode Island is this big and it has one community college and two state universities and they weren't talking to each other in a state that's like the size of, I don't know, it's not very big. Um, and and even they were saying, how is it that in this state that's so small where everybody knows each other that we're not talking to each other? That's all it takes and they haven't done it because that's not been their priority. That's not been, and so what happens over time is that you get students who, who go through this process and they take electives that don't transfer. And so when they do, if they do persist and transfer to a four-year university, they have to start again. Um, and take courses again, which me, which is why they don't finish in four years or five years, and they take six years, which adds on top of the already high price of higher education, not only 50% more to their cost, but two years of foregone income that they would have been earning had they graduated in four years as they had expected they would. What happens to them? They tell their younger siblings, they tell their their the the, the younger people that behind them in their high schools, that higher education doesn't work and they stop going to college. And that's what's been happening. Kathleen. Yeah, so John, a while ago, you wrote about the three-year baccalaureate, uh, which I'm hearing some of the themes from that story and in your description there. Um, and I know that that's not a widespread strategy, but it seems like one that would be very appealing to a lot of students and their families. I wonder if you've you know, heard much more about that phenomenon or uh, what are what are some of the barriers in the way to, you know, a lot of a lot of students are able to do it. Like, how? why not all? S students are able to do it already. Uh, very disciplined students who are willing to take a lot of credits at a time. Some uh, new universities are starting. One of them is actually called New U uh, with a three year model with longer semesters so that they meet. There's certain credit hour regulations that the federal government imposes. So you have to teach in order to provide a credit that has to represent a certain number of hours in a classroom or online. Um, and that makes three-year degrees a little bit more challenging. But there is some there is some momentum behind it, it largely because of this, this public um, uh, you know, antipathy toward the time it takes to go to college. If if we learned anything over the last three years, it's uh, that time is precious. And you can't just take advantage, take for granted, take things for granted. And I think people paid closer attention to that. We saw that in the Great Resignation with all the people that realized they didn't like their jobs. Um, there's another less recognized um, trend of early retirements. People are just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And the same thing has begun to be true, I think, among students and their families who don't want to spend six years in college. Uh, they don't think it's worth it. It's not just the cost, it's the time. Which is which is in itself kind of a cost. Yeah, makes times sense. Are, times are not, it's a, a difficult constant to deal with because it's baked in, right? Because the credit hours, the hour of in class time, the fifty minutes of out of class study time, and you add that up, and then your your three credit course, you know, takes thirteen to eighteen study hours per week. The only way to mess with time is to look at academic calendar uh, uh, reformation, whether you're cutting out breaks. You're reducing term lengths, you're going from one to the next. That really serves adult students, 
right? Um, you, you'll see big universities do that, serving the adult student that can move faster. And we've seen the shift of what, who is the traditional student now? Is it the 18 year old going off to a four year find myself university? Or is it the new traditional student who's the adult student who's got kids and family trying to upskill and reskill and so on? And then on top of that, you put this credential wild west. You've got this credential and that credential. And I always say my brother Ricky's girlfriend's cousin's real estate license. Uh, and it's like really hard to understand. And then put somebody who's a first gen student in that, in that mix of all that noise or somebody from a lower economic background. And you have somebody that says college isn't worth it. Go take my cousin brother's Ricky. I can't re reproduce that <laughs> credential. It's very hard to understand how to become educated and what has what's worthwhile and what isn't. How do we, I don't know, process this whole credentialing? Right, right. Because a lot of those credentials are not really worth it either. Uh, they're shorter term, and so and so students are students are drawn to them. Um, and incidentally, who's behind those credentials? Higher education institutions, because they can make a lot of money off of those credentials. Uh, but but one thing I want to pick up on one thing that you said about the academic calendar. In mo in in ninety nine percent of institutions, you start in the fall or you start in the winter. So why can't you start whenever you want to start? Why can't you take courses in the summer? And, and, and we see this public sentiment about time, the time cost in this huge trend of students, four-year bachelor's degree seeking students largely, who over the summer will enroll at their local community college to keep, to keep accumulating credits because they don't want to stay forever in college. The second you take only four four courses in your fresh first semester of your freshman year, you're you're now not going to graduate in four years. Uh, it has to be five. And very well-meaning universities and colleges and faculty advisors have encouraged, especially first-generation students from poorly resourced public high schools, to only take four courses just so that they can ease their transition into college. They're not they're not doing those kids any service. They are immediately putting them behind. Um, so you have to take enough credits every semester. Can we can we do that in three years? Yes, you you would lose some of what people get in a college experience. But I think a lot of students now are not just adult students, but um, traditional age college students are are, are looking for uh, to get through quicker. Kathleen. Yeah. So John, I'm uh, as a former journalist, I'm really eager to hear a little bit of your thinking about. How Can you I cover interrupt your and say, are you ever a former journalist or are you just a journalist <laughs> who continues on in other industries? Who knows? I may go back. I've been known to do that. Um, but I, I wonder, you know, how you find your stories, what stories you're looking for, what are some of the things you're mining for the future? Well, as let's you start the insanity. Yeah, I was going to say, as you can probably tell, there's no shortage of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I said at the, at the top that this is job security. I mean, higher education was the kind of thing where I, it's really fascinating to me that back when I went to college, um, you if you had your heart set on a particular college, your family would do whatever it took to, to get you into that college. We didn't think about cost or outcomes or what was going on with the graduates. Um, interestingly, can I, can there's I say that I I'm sorry, John, I have to disagree. I did some thorough research. I know. I mean, it's been a while since I went to college, but I did look at the male female ratio of my college. I felt like there should be, you know, less dudes and, and more ladies at my college. I, so I did some thorough research. Just so you well, know. you'll be happy to know that among the many interesting trends in higher education, women now outnumber men by two to one. Right. Um, not only because they're obviously smarter, but because men stopped going to college. This new enrollment data that just came out this week shows that that's, that might be reversing a little bit, but still, um, uh, where were we before we got on that? I, know, I, I told a joke every now and then and dissuade us. How you find all these amazing stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, th there's there's just more stories than we can get to. And I think one of the ways that we approach stories is not to tell them. I, I have esteemed colleagues and counterparts at, at trade publications that cover higher education for people in higher education. We, Our partners are the Washington Post, the New York Times. We speak to lay readers. And that response that you were mentioning on social media um, earlier is, is, I think, largely comes from people who already work inside higher education. But we also hear from, from consumers who, who say, you know, yeah, it's true, this university wouldn't give me my transcript because I owe $10 for a parking ticket, or 
you, you begin to, to hear back that anger. Um, and so I think for the same reason that we all somehow considered higher education to be different than a typical consumer product for so many years, it is only slowly that people are beginning to cover it that way. Universities and colleges hate being hate, hate their students being called customers, but what else are they? Of course, they're customers. Um, that goes back to that Utah Valley University uh, story and the issue of accountability. Um, in the story, as you know, the, it, it talks about how the, there was a big fight over incorporating accountability in the mission statement because the faculty didn't want to didn't want the word accountability there. They felt that 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 um, suggested the wrong the wrong motivations. And I can't understand in what other industry you wouldn't want accountability for your performance. Um, on the other hand, they have a they have a valid point to make when they object to anonymous student evaluations being used to determine promotions and tenure. So there there's a dynamic there that I think there are valid arguments on on, on both sides. Great inflation pressures. I mean, there's right there's things that are a confluence of factors. So um, so there's no shortage of what's going of 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 coverage topics. Um, they have to do with, we always look for places that are trying to solve these problems. And interestingly, a lot of colleges and universities that we find are, that are trying interesting reforms are run by, they have two things in common. One is that they are at risk. No one ever makes changes to a, to a system unless they, um, unless they're, it's, they're in an existential crisis. And the other thing that we see that these institutions have in common is that they often are run by leaders who are not academics. So there's a, I, I have made a really interesting visit to an, uh, an art school and art schools are, art schools are, are hugely imperiled. They're extraordinarily expensive. Their students graduate with enormous debt and generally not huge incomes. Um, and, the, and this very small art school in Portland, Maine uh, hired a new president who, has, who had an MBA and she made really sensible changes. Uh, they created classrooms where, there, where the the um, the desks and the walls weren't permanent, so they could change programs as student tastes changed and student preferences changed. So, for instance, in art schools now, the hot the hot uh, topics are animation and anime mm -hmm. and. Um, and those are those are very very good paying jobs, and their enrollment went up, uh, which is contrary to what happens in most art schools. They open the building 24 hours a day because students don't work from nine to five. In fact, they don't get up until 11, and they don't go to, co to go to class, as you recall, on Fridays and now Thursdays. They don't take huh. classes on Thursdays to Fridays because nice. they like four day weekends. And if they happen, and maybe they're working part time to go to college as well, they want to be able to go in and work in the in the studio in the middle of the night. And so now they can do that. So, just the simplest things like that can make an enormous difference. You know, John, what I um, in the dreaded for profit sector that I worked in for fifteen years, one of the things we were say what you will about what positive and negatives there were. One of the things that I took away from my time in career education was this business uh, acumen. We there there was no endowments. We we worked very hard, start to start, person to person, number to number, and we tracked everything. I said my next book is going to be about how I transitioned from for profit to non profit higher ed, and I thought nobody will ever read that. So I'll read that. <laughs> yeah, I, scra I scrapped it. But I do find in bo bo both both uh, even at Lindenwood. Um, by the way, Lindenwood is uh, our president is a thirty three year veteran of IBM. And the number one reason I came to, to my job as a senior vice president of Linwood Global is because I'd work for a president that would not do the academic or would question the academic uh, uh, hula hoops, if you will. Um, but anyway, my point being is that higher ed typically, at least in the nonprofit realm, isn't that good at business because we don't look at it like a business and th therefore we spend too much or not tracking numbers, ins and outs as closely as we should. Is that the fundamental problem that if we solve, if we start thinking like a business, things get better? Um, so let me first say that uh, I've written about how about for-profit education and the lessons from it that nonprofit education can, can learn. So for example, postgraduate outcomes, um, largely because frankly, for-profit education isn't always it, that the numbers have been under attack by a lot of advocacy groups and activists. Um, for-profit education uses uh, third-party confirmation to see where it's, sir. yeah, yeah, 
um, to see where its, its graduates end up, uh, which is one of the really important things you want to know before you spend a lot of money on your college education. Nonprofits and public universities, when they come out with their, I, they, I just got one and I wanted to write them back um, because this bothers me so much. They're essentially lying to you when they say 98% of our graduates have jobs Yikes. because way down in the fine print, you find out where they got that number and they got that number from an email survey. And I know that you guys respond to every email survey that you ever get. Oh, oh, only from John um, Marcus, for record. <laughs> and and when you look at when you look at that um, that that response rate, it's usually fifty percent. So what they're really saying is that ninety eight percent of the fifty percent of their students who they know where they are have jobs. Um, and uh, I, you know, it also sort of begs the question: why don't why don't one hundred percent of them have jobs? Which is another really uh -huh. good question. Um, and for-profits actually do that. They really have reliable, authoritative, legitimate numbers for that, um, in part because they have to. So there are lessons to be learned from the for-profit sector. Uh, as, far as, as far as acting like a business, higher education is, is nonprofit. Um, it doesn't even always act like, like a nonprofit, in my opinion. I mean, I look at the financials of these institutions and... Uh, people are paid extraordinarily well, and they get perks that you, that Fortune 500 CEOs don't get. Presidents and sometimes other administrators get houses, uh, cars provided, um, country club memberships where they can, you know, uh, entertain donors. Um, uh, after they leave, they get uh, full-time positions in the faculty, even when they aren't actually teaching anything, which is literally true they pay these these former presidents money for nothing um uh -huh. this is this is money that could be used for especially right now in this environment this is money that could be used for daycare services and other other really important and essential uh services so so in a way they shouldn't act like businesses they should act like nonprofits and be more responsible with the money people have entrusted to them um, and, uh, and, uh, and on the service side, they should act more like for-profits and, uh, and provide services to students to consider their students to be customers. I wrote a story years ago, uh, about how some colleges were beginning to market themselves. And this was the story. It was at a time when colleges were so reluctant to even use that word that the headline was the M word for marketing. <laughs> now colleges and universities spend more than $3 billion a year collectively on marketing and advertising. And um, because they think that's one solution to their problem. I don't know that if you're advertising a product that people don't like, it doesn't matter that you're advertising it. You need to fix the product. Kathleen, do you have any more questions for John before we uh, get close to closing this out? Yeah. Um... This is all uh, really incredible. I'd, I'd love to know what's the next piece you're working on. Uh, I'd love to know that too. Okay, we're, <laughs> uh, the next piece that we're working on that I can tell you about. Ooh, tell we're, us the one that you can't tell us about. But, uh, <laughs> well, I can tell you in general, we're working on a lot of stories. This year, we're gonna be paying a lot of attention to the to the likelihood of more colleges closing. And the reason that we're, we think this is gonna be an issue this year is because a number of colleges were on the edge until COVID and they were uh, saved briefly by COVID funding. Um, they got COVID emergency funding. That's running out. That's that's running out. Their enrollment isn't re re rebounding. They're facing the same inflationary pressures all of us are. If you think about what colleges spend money on, it's labor, food, and energy. Um, and those are the three areas that have seen the most inflation. So in fact, because of this discount rate problem that they have, they are raising their tuition, but they're still not, uh, their revenues aren't keeping, keeping pace with inflation. So we expect to see more colleges close. That's gonna mm -hmm. be one area of coverage. We'll continue to cover the ramifications of this enrollment decline, which include the fact we talked earlier about community colleges. Community colleges train a lot of people that we really need in our, in our economy. Um, when you call the doctor's office and you want to schedule an appointment, that person went to community college. And with far fewer people going to community college, there are going to be huge shortages in areas like that. Um, some people go to community college to learn things like tech. Uh, in fact, some people with associate degrees to the credit of community colleges make more money than some people with bachelor's degrees if they study, uh, if they study technology. Uh, again, we 
we th that that shortage may be eased by the fact that all the technology companies are laying off tens of thousands right. of people, but but there's still going to be a long term need for those people, and we and we aren't producing them. So that's an area that we're covering. And finally, we're covering. Um, worsening inequity. And we're going to see the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action soon. But even if you put that aside, universities and colleges, despite their, you mentioned earlier about how universities promise de diversity, they don't, they, they haven't lived up to that either. And, um, uh, and in fact, if you look at college as a ladder to the uh, middle class, it isn't that anymore. And um, uh, we've seen a decline in the number of black students. That's exactly the opposite direction it should be going. Um, we, we've seen a decline in the proportion. Again, these numbers came out this week of black degree holders in America. Um, and so, uh, we're seeing a lot of things going in the wrong direction in terms of equity. So those are some general areas of coverage that you'll see coming up. You talked about the big M for marketing. It's, it shifted to merger. I feel like the big M might sure. be merger now, um, because we're seeing, you know, for the book we interviewed, I don't know, a couple hundred university folk. I don't, you know, we don't have exact uh, ti titles. It's like 48% said their university was exploring a merger acquisition. Oh. That's a really interesting space now because those words are business words, boy. Merger and acquisition, that's, you don't see that. And what does that mean in higher ed? And people are starting to really, I don't know, think about that more often, aren't they? Yes, if you do it right, a merger can be can be good. So where a merger doesn't work is if both institutions are already teaching all the same stuff. Right. Where, where a merger does work is if two institutions with, with complementary, um, you know, majors and, and subjects come together so that they can widen the um, selection of, of choices for their students and prospective students. And most importantly, on a, on a you know, using, using business terminology, they lower their per unit cost because they can serve more the, the two stu, the two institutions that emerged presumably their enrollment also merges so that they have larger enrollment which they can serve with the same sized administrative staff therefore lowering the cost of administration another area where we haven't really touched on where the number of administrators no offense have <laughs> has increased has increased significantly um, the number of administrators in the last 25 years has at universities and colleges has doubled at a period of time when the enrollment has declined. So in some cases, legitimately, uh, development officers who, who bring in money, sustainability officers, which we didn't even used to have, security, mental health, all of those things are needed. But there are also a lot of administrators that I, God knows what they even do. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I do one of these days uh, when I figure it out. No, I, I, I do know what I do. Um, I, I wanted to add, though, um, to one of your points, the um, to the merger conversation. Usually when you have mergers and acquisitions, there's usually for-profit companies involved, and you're paying out one company that goes, yes, I'd love to sell and, and merge, and you're going to pay me out in, in my equity. When you have two nonprofits getting together, the one, w either board maybe, has no, really, there's nothing like, moving them along to really seek out a merger to save the the institutional name you might as well just let it go out of business if you don't care because you don't want your identity taken by somebody else it's really that's an interesting phenomenon how a nonprofit board who has no equity can move that's a great that's a great point uh there have been some instances in which the the smaller institution typically the the threatened institution makes a deal that um a portion of the of the of the resulting institution has it has its name yeah. but interestingly the the successor institution also gets its endowment so you're not only giving away the name and the culture and the tradition and the history of the institution you're giving away all of its assets um in, in some cases mergers have occurred like northeastern in boston with mills in california because the success the larger institution wants the real estate universities and colleges in america do have one asset of ma massive value, and that is their real estate. So um, so th that's driving some mergers. And when you mentioned private uh, uh, entities doing mergers, I, I thought you were going in one of two directions. One is a lot of consulting firms that are now getting started, who's, this shows you how big of a deal mergers are going to be in higher education, whose primary uh, or sole uh, responsibility is helping colleges to merge. Mm -hmm. um, they see such a huge market for that. But the other thing that's really interesting is that some nonprofits are 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 assuming for profits. So 
Purdue with Kaplan and now uh, El, is it Arkansas, I think, with uh, um, F University of Phoenix University and of UMass, Brandman, U U University, University of, of Arizona and U Ashford. Exactly. So uh, they're Arkansas they're got Grantham. Anyway, I can keep <laughs> going. They're, they're taking over the nonprofits are taking over the for profits because they want that enrollment and revenue stream and um, and some of the technology that they bring to provide education online. And sometimes it's easier to build it to go grab it than it is to build it internally amongst all the things that you talked about in this episode. Although you inherit, again, not always, but in some cases you inherit the good, but also the bad um, in, in, the, in those kinds of transactions at the, as the University of Arizona has discovered. Um, and, the, and although they're stingy with the data, I think uh, Purdue's numbers with Kaplan haven't been what they now call Purdue Global, have not been as, as, as big as they, I think, is expected. Why do I feel like John's my new best friend? I, I can know, talk to him right? forever. We could do this all day. <laughs> well, Kathleen, do you have any final questions you want to get to John and then I'll ask him? No, final I'm a little worried. He's got a lot of work to do and we are getting in the way of that. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm John. just going to, I'm going to spend the rest of the afternoon thinking of all the other topics we, we can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. That means we have to have you back. Um, number one, what did we not say about John Marcus in the Hedginger report that you would like to say? Anything coming out, speaking engagements you have going on? plug away to our audience. And number two, what do you see as the future of higher education? Uh, Heckinger does a lot of consumer facing things. We have a tool called the tuition tracker. Uh, it's one of the more interesting things that we've uh, put together, our data people, and it's just about to be updated. What, what it shows you is tuition over time. It shows you the tuition by institution. It shows you lots of interesting information about every university and college. Uh, including what you'll pay based on your income, your family's Amazing. income uh, over time. And and it predicts what that price will be over the next few years so wow. that you, you can get a sense of where that's going to go. And that's coming out soon. Well, it exists now on our website, but an update is coming soon. We use uh, data that is lags real time to some degree, which is a problem with federal education data. But um, but that's coming up. Um, uh, and you, oh, the future of higher education. I was going to say the easy one to end the episode. Yeah, I was going to say that's a bigger, that's a bigger question. Um, uh, I think we're going to see a huge shakeup. Um, so even on top of the enrollment decline, so which is, which is propelled by demographics, there's fewer 18 year olds, um, but, but also by this value issue and the proportion of high school graduates who are choosing to go to college being way, way down 12, down 12 percentage points in Indiana, down 12 percentage points in Tennessee, the proportion of students going on to college, down nationally from, I think, 70% to 63% of high school graduates who go directly to college. No one is paying attention to that. Everyone thought this enrollment decline was because of COVID. It wasn't. It, was it might have been a tiny bit, but it's about a lot of other things. That demographic decline gets worse in the mid 2020s. Why? Because in 2008 we had a recession. People stop having children in recessions. Mm -hmm. Those children that weren't born would have been turning 18 in the mid 2020s and going to college. So you're going to see another huge drop off in the mid 2020s. So there's just no way of avoiding a a, a big a big um, shake up. A lot more colleges closing people needing to come up with new ways of providing higher education. I think a lot of people are working on it. Um, they've been working on it for a while. We'll see if they succeed. Uh, if if the the closer we get to a crisis, the the more they'll be able to, to finally focus their minds. Wow, Kathleen, what do you think about this conversation? Mind is blown. Your your head was broken earlier. Mine's broken now, but um, know, what does that say about a lot to think uh, about, yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you this, um, John, what's the best way to follow you and your work? Just go to the website? Uh, yep, heckingerreport.org. All of our stories also run in major national media. Uh, and uh, I always post my stories on my on my Twitter feed, which is uh, at John Marcus Boston. And um, uh, yeah, so that's where you can see them. Awesome. Well, I will tell you, Kathleen, you know, it's always an honor to have you back. Thank you. She's this Kathleen was great. Kennedy I love Manzo. being here. EVP, Education, Labor, and Economy for Hager Sharp. We'll see you again, won't we, Kathleen? Yes. And of course, our esteemed guest today, what I would like you to do, ladies and gentlemen, is please do this first. Come on, put your hands up in the air. I got to have a little bit of fun with him. Uh, here he is. Let me get back to the button I need to hit. 
This is John Marcus. He's higher education editor for the Hechinger Report. I cannot say it. I keep Hechinger trying. Hechinger Report. Hechinger. Hechinger. I even wrote it down phonetically. Uh, John, did you have a good experience today on the podcast? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention? It's time for us to solve the puzzle of success in higher education. Get your ticket to Elucian Live for industry insights, powerful connections, and innovative solutions. From March 26th through 29th, join peers from around the world in New Orleans to unlock the possibility and drive student and institutional success. Learn more and register at elive.elucian.com. It's time to level up. The beginning of a new era in higher education begins with you. Order your copy of Commencement. The beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert, Dr. Joseph Lucille, with contributions by Elvin Freitas. It's higher education's must-read book of 2022. Discover how you can seize the moment to change higher education forever. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, now available on Amazon. For bulk orders, contact Kate, Joe, or Elvin. 